So my goal is to make myself as a coach redundant because what I want is to impart the techniques and skills and knowledge that I know so that they can kind of coach themselves. I was recently interviewed by Derek, the founder of Grand Prix Tour, and we talk about things like why Last Tenth Coaching is so special. Every new driver I've coached has always come back for more lessons. Here's how it went. Tell us a bit about Last Tenth. When did you start coaching and like what's different about the Last Tenth approach? Last Tenth, it started as a YouTube channel, so many of which uh, people would probably have seen it. Um, and it really started because I saw a lot of videos out there that were in two camps, like often one that is very kind of scientifically accurate, but um, not as entertaining as you might like it to be. And uh, another camp where it's entertaining, there's authoritative figures, um, people of respect, but it's not entirely scientifically accurate. So I, I kind of looked at it and thought, why can't it be from a very scientific background, um, everything is factual, scientifically accurate, but you know, it's maybe a five, 10 minute video with uh, images to help people absorb it and entertaining something you can kind of just, you know, sit for five minutes, even on the can and, and kind of watch it. And that's that's kind of how it started. And um, shortly after I had people approaching me for advice and then, <laughs> then somebody offered me money to, to help them. And at the time I thought, why why is somebody offering me money to, to help them play a video game, right? But as that kind of went by, I kind of realized, you know what, it's a hobby. People want to get better and people have disposable income. It's no different than a tennis coach or a golf coach. So, and that's kind of how it started. And so the coaching is different in the sense that um, it's very data oriented, but it's not what you think. So uh, if you look at a lot of data oriented um, coaching out there, it's, it's 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 a lot of comparative, right? It's it's you have a faster driver with a lap, and you you kind of look at it. So, oh, he turns in here, he breaks here, he does this different, and that's why he's faster. And I don't do any of that in my coaching. I don't use reference data. I just use the students' data, and I look at where the mistakes are. So where he's using too much steering, uh, where he's braking too hard or not braking hard enough, where his throttle application is too fast or maybe even too slow. Um, and everything is compared to what I think, in my opinion, is scientifically optimal, like physically optimal, right? And the whole premise of that is when you try to copy or mimic a faster driver, um, you assume that they make no mistakes. And when they do make mistakes, you copy that too. So I thought, why, why not just skip the middleman and just go straight to optimal? Why not figure out where the technical problems are with the student, whether they're not using their wheel properly, whether they don't know when they're at the grip limit of the car, whether they don't know if they're using uh, all of the track, and what are the techniques to help them know and identify these things on their own so that they can make me redundant, right? So my goal is to make myself as a coach redundant because um, what I want is to impart the techniques and skills and knowledge that I know so that they can kind of coach themselves. I know you've talked about this in the in the past, but basically when you do sort of like the track guide approach where you're you're almost learning a track by rote, you know, you can't really take that with you to the next track. And the way that you coach is really designed to help you be able to identify where am I getting, you know, better or worse, you know, where am I doing well, where am I not doing well, and be able to diagnose that no matter what track you're on or what car you're driving. Yeah, exactly. It's a balance of both. It's not to say like a oh, road dri driving is terrible or, or, you know, it's you really need both. And and the issue I find is that um, most drivers are only aware of road driving or are heavily reliant on road driving. So if we look at, well, maybe balance is 50 50 with road and uh, what I call fundamental or passive driving. Mm -hmm. um, I think with a lot of drivers that I see is that uh, they're predominantly on the road side. And it's not just sim, like I, as you know, I, I instruct and coach in real life uh, for various groups and I see this in real life as well. And so this approach really came to me as uh, the backstories I've been, you know, doing track days and driving in real life for probably around 20 years now. And I was always coached like that, turn in here, break here, apex here, exit here. And every time I got out of the car, I thought to myself, I didn't learn how to drive. Nobody ever told me, well, you got to do this because you're experiencing these cues. Therefore, you know, your apex is too late or too early. Nobody has ever explained this to me. And so when I started coaching, I figured, you know what? I, I don't want to be the coach that I didn't like. 
And that's not to say that's bad or anything, because sometimes I do use track guide coaching for myself if I'm pressed for time. Um, but what I found is that when you do that, you don't actually learn technique. Right. And so, like you said, when you go to another track or drive another car or drive the same car at the same track in different conditions, you lose your ability to adapt because your markers will change, your line will change, but they don't realize it and they just keep driving the same lines. And one really simple example is if you look at the newer drivers that do a race where they're forced to have a pit stop or tire change, a lot of times they'll come out of the pit with cold tires and usually one of two things happen. One, they'll just wipe out and wreck the car. Or two, they have to severely underdrive the car. And so I find that's an issue with the drivers not knowing how to, in real time, understand whether they're at grip limit or not, and to adapt to these new tires very quickly. So either they drive the same pace they did when they went into the pits, which is way too hot for cold tires, or they realize that the cold tires have less grip, but they have to have leave so much margin because they don't know where that grip limit is. So my goal is to help drivers understand the science and theory behind it, but also what does that mean when you're behind the wheel and things are happening at you in real time? And how do you adapt to that in real time? So how do you approach strategy going into a race? I know you mentioned it a little bit. And and then like, what about setup? To answer your question, in terms of strategy, I, well, I first start with setup, right? So I'll start, if I don't know the track, I'll learn the track and I start with setup. And usually I start with arrow. Like, do I want a mid, high or low kind of downforce? And um, with the, you know, I just drive a few laps and with the data I collect, I usually have a pretty good idea of where I kind of want to be, right? Mm -hmm. And from there, I'll just kind of tweak the setup. And it's always a challenge because you have to decide, you know, when to stop because a setup is never done, right? Yep. Just like improving your driving is never done or learning a track or preparing for a race, it's never done. Um, you know, one of my students, he, he creates a, a checklist of things to do in preparation for a race in terms of practice you know, practicing pit stops and stuff like that, everything, right? And, you know, there's a whole list of stuff you got to go through. And, you know, when do you say, oh, this is good enough? Because in my opinion, good enough is never good enough, right? Right. Um, so, but you know, at some point I just say, okay, I, I, I got to move on to something else. And so after I do the setup, I'll look at strategy. And usually it comes down to, nowadays with a lot of leagues, there's a pit stop. And what I try to explore is, do I really need to take that pit stop, right? And if I don't, am I actually gaining an advantage? So you knowing that we've been betaing our app uh, called Easy Race, which is basically a strategy uh, application, right? So for example, some users have used it and been able to kind of cut 20 seconds off their entire race uh, by being able to skip a pit stop, right? So that's kind of what I would explore. I would look at, well, you know, if I cut a pit stop and I feel safe, am I able to save time and how much time and then also strategically, depending on where I start, do I want to save fuel, right? So maybe if I'm at the front, I might actually want to save fuel because I will hold all the cars behind me back. Meanwhile, they're not saving fuel. So by the time they realize it's too late for them to switch strategies, right? And you know what, like in one of my videos, you'll probably notice that there's a saying, the easiest pass you ever make is the, is the one when they're in the pits, right? Yeah. So that's kind of my approach in terms of strategy. Aside from that, there are nuances like, you know, do you do you want to favor the straights or the corners? Um, do you want to, you know, favor stability or being on edge? It all depends, like how long the race is and stuff like that, and the driver. So there, there are a lot of nuances to that. That's great. I mean, having just done Le Mans, I can tell you how much time I spent um, trying <laughs> to decide: do I run six wing or eight wing? You know, do I want to be fast down the Molson straight or do I want to be fast yeah. in the Porsche curves? Because you can't do both. Like you literally cannot yeah. do both. <laughs> and it's it's also: uh, do I want to take a lot of curb? Do I want to soften it up and take a lot of curb, or yep. do I want stability, aero stability, going through the Porsches? Because you know, you go like especially with a GTP, right? You, you go into the Porsches. Uh, you know, with maybe a lift, maybe maybe a tap on the brake. But as you're going through the last stretch of it, you're you're flat. So that rate changes from entering to, to exiting is is quite different, right? So, you know, do you want to stiffen it up and uh, stiffen your third springs and, and make sure you have that kind of similar balance from the start to end of the Porsches? But then, you know, that hurts you on all the curbs, right? So it's it's like with anything, like setup is always just a compromise. Do do I want this in, in favor of that or that in favor of this? So in the um, Porsche Club of America, we both 
race in the pro class for that. And uh, we both did pretty well at the Magello race, which I, uh, was just a few months ago. And it was yeah. your setup that I was running and you were running and we finished like fourth and fifth, right? Um, so it was fun to see. I knew that I didn't have anything on you when it came to set up um, yeah. once I was behind you because there was just nothing nothing in it between the two of us. So, Well, um, I, I think even that, like, it, it's not to say that um, setup is a very personal thing too, right? So it might fit, like, you know that I've done setups because uh, because I'm doing the race and I share it with my students and certain affiliate groups for the last 10th. And not everybody uses it just because, well, you know, some people don't like it, but also because, um, and, and I think this is sort of what I think you might be alluding to is that you can probably make it better, but you know, what's the cost benefit, right? Like you might spend five hours on it and gain a 10th, but you know, that five hours might be better off conquering one corner or, or something. Right. So, yep. and I think that's where setup shops really shine is that, you know, they take the bulk of a work away from you and that, yeah, you can, you can kind of feed in more time, but what's the most efficient way of spending your time when you're prepping for a race, right? So uh, the Grand Prix Tour, you know, is sort of a second dimension of it. In addition to having these you know, world-class drivers, we, we strive to have the best drivers basically in iRacing. So we focus on clean driving and you've been yeah. generous enough to support the league and join us as uh, sort of our independent third party incident mm -hmm. review team member. So you're on the committee that reviews any incidents that the drivers want to submit for review. What mm -hmm. What is it that you think makes the difference between those drivers who can only be fast and really just aren't that safe? What, what, how do you balance being fast and safe? Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, first of all, it's culture, right? I think a lot of the drivers uh, in, in this league right now came from several groups which pride themselves in being clean and being able to risk manage. And I, I have to say, like being in the committee like it's kind of cool because there's not a lot of work for me to do because there aren't that many <laughs> we that many graduates. Are, yeah not a lot of reviews being being filed um so I, I think we've been like i don't know i don't i've lost count how many races we've gone without a single irr being filed like and and i would also now. add that yeah four wow yeah. i would also add that i think the average i rating is is a bit misleading because I, I think the driving quality is certainly higher than that because Knowing a lot of the drivers, uh, many of them, like myself, don't really participate in public races anymore. So like for myself, I've done maybe five public races in the last like two or three years. Yep. Right. So uh, a lot of the drivers in the league have really, really, really stale I ratings. Um, so I think when you kind of look at the incident counts versus the I rating, it, it's, it's a little bit skewed because that's not really their true I rating. But I think in terms of the balance of sort of aggression and safety is that sure in the race it's something to consider and there are there are very there are a lot of instances where you need to change it so it's not like the entire race this is the balance i work with so you might start with a default of you know certain things you don't do certain things you do do certain gaps you go for certain gaps you don't but you know like many people know at the end of the race uh, if you're fighting for position you might be a bit more aggressive or the final race of the season you're racing your rival hey you might leave him a little bit less room than you normally do with other drivers right um, and I think that's pretty common, but I think what also some people don't realize is that even from lap to lap, you can actually tweak that balance from corner to corner, right? So for example, most sports, my real life home track here, and I drive it in real life differently than in the sim purely because of the fear factor, right? But for example, in the sim, uh, in real life, turn four is a very challenging corner because it's blind, it's really fast. And if you go down wrong, like you're you're done, walls on both sides. Where in the sim is, you're probably most often comfortably flat down four. But the problem is when you go up five, it's kind of, again, blind, heavy braking zone. And if you miss your mark, you're, you're going straight into the wall, straight into the dirt, straight into the wall. So you kind of think of, well, where do you want to push yourself more, right? At four or five, for example, in the sim. So. I would say probably four or even one or two or three rather than five. So, you know, I'm kind of giving a little bit of this away. Generally, you'll see me drive five, entering five a little bit more conservatively than any other corner. When you have certain corners, which are maybe a bit more tricky or a bit more high risk because there are walls around or it's very easy to hit dirt or something like that, you may want to scale it down a little bit or maybe not race people as hard in those corners. So I think a lot of times people realize there's a balance with how you conduct the entire race, 
how you conduct the beginning versus the end or who you're racing against, whether they're safe or aggressive or unsafe, but also from a corner to corner, within the lap, there are various places where you can take a bit more risk in certain areas where you probably shouldn't. I think you made a great point because I think what yep. you're describing is experience. I don't, I certainly haven't figured out how to drive safely without just making a bunch of mistakes, you know, along the yep. way. And, uh, and you start to learn when you can push something, when you can't, when the tires are giving up, you know, when you've got grip, um, who that person next to you is, you know, and can I trust them? And I, I think, you know, your, your comment about experience is, is kind of totally nail on the head. I, I find like, just going back to your question about balancing aggression with risk. Um, so, so I came from a financial background where, where I do, you know, investment research. And so risk reward is my everyday thing, right? So mm -hmm. when you kind of look at that, it's not a, it's not a static thing, right? So as a driver learns, improves, makes mistakes, interacts with different drivers, newer drivers, better drivers, worse drivers, faster, slower drivers, their perception of that balance kind of evolves over time and it settles uh, it, it kind of converges to a certain point that is suitable for them. And that kind of becomes their driving style, right? It's basically their habits. So I think it's not something that people get right immediately. And it's not something that people should get right immediately. I think it's always something that they will progressively get better and better at it. And then they'll notice, you know, something happened, like they got an incident. And the important part is studying these incidents, right? You get an incident, you always always review what happened, always look at it from multiple angles, always take your own kind of personality out of it and see, well, you know, like, like people always say, what can I do to avoid this? Should I have done this? Was this worth what I tried to do? Yeah. Right. Um, and it's, it's an evolution. People, you know, progressively kind of learn. So you, you've been involved a little bit with the Grand Prix Tour League that we started uh, basically at the beginning of this year. Yeah. Uh, the mm -hmm. average I rating of the drivers in the Grand Prix Tour right now is over 3,300. And you've certainly seen how it's doing something similar to what you've done with Last Tenth, right? Where we're taking the traditional yeah. league experience in I racing and, uh, and tweaking it just enough to, to make it something different. So we just completed yeah. our second major championship race which is this unique feature of the league where we set up certain races to be deliberately more challenging so we just did Le Mans and it was a 75 minute race instead of 60. We frequently pick the most technical tracks for these kinds of, um, of races. We ran Coda a, a month or so ago and we put the wind at just like as high as it could go and hot um, in the sim. So mm -hmm. we're trying to throw you know tough conditions, technical tracks at the drivers it's a very highly skilled driver group. Um, and then we reward more points um, for the performance in those events. So, uh, well, first of all, I, I want to say that it's it's really cool that, you know, GPT's kind of taking this approach because I find a lot of times in a lot of leagues, there are challenges, but I find um, there can be more dimensions of challenge, Yep. right? So a lot of leagues you get challenged, uh, you get challenges as in you get really, really, really quick drivers and yep. you just have to compete with them on pace, but you know, very few leagues, and I, don't, I know there are some, but very few leagues, at least the ones I participated, will maybe force you to run two pit stops, but if you're savvy, you can run one, yep. right? And how does that work? Or like you said, what if you put a strong headwind on the on this long straight and have to get the drivers to figure out how to work their arrow a bit better? right a bit more efficient with their arrow so um I, I think it's really cool that you're taking this approach to kind of have in each round have like very specific challenges it's almost like a game within the game to um sort of elevate the driving awesome all right well thank you nikki appreciate uh the time tonight and uh looking forward to the rest of our season together and, and thank you for your contributions to the league